morning, everybody. How you doing? My name is Robbie Millsap, and I'm from the Microsoft Learn team. And I'm going to start with a confession. I just ate two Rice Krispie Cheats, so I don't know what I'm going to say right now. So it should be exciting. We're here to talk today not about Rice Krispie Cheats, though. We're going to talk about SAS. First of all, who here is familiar with the well-architected framework? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that. OK, I see a couple of hands over here. Can you name the five pillars of well-architected? It's performance efficiency, security, cost. Anybody else? Operational what? Operational excellence. And anyone else? All right, reliability, very good. So we're going to talk today about SaaS on Well Architected. Well Architected has been something that I've been involved in for several years. Um, it defines uh, how we're going to build workloads. And workloads are just a, a set of resources that provide business outcomes, right? So that could be databases, it can be code, all kinds of things. But uh, today we're going to talk about a specific workload on WAF around SaaS. And with me, I have two fantastic teammates. I have Charles and I have Ben, who are going to talk all about this. And it's going to be really, really, really important. And you're going to be glad that you listened to it. So take it away, Charles and Ben. All right, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, the, the Well Architected Framework and go do a little bit of a deep dive on a couple of the design areas specific to the SaaS. Um, and then Charles um, will talk a bit about the network um, uh, section around um, SaaS. And then we'll kind of finish it up with uh, what the assessment looks like for SaaS workloads. And I uh, want to just give a quick note. The person who's actually supposed to be presenting today is not here. Um, so the, the peop, um, just um, she's um, unfortunately uh, out sick. And so we're kind of standing in for her. Um, so we're going to run through her, her deck really quickly. And hopefully, we can answer your questions at the end. So let's, uh, let's go forward. So but before I get too into it, let's talk a little bit about what is SaaS and what is ISV, et cetera, because they are different. And we want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing when we're, when we're talking about well-architected design principles and uh, design areas. So when we talk about SaaS, we're really talking about a business model. A business model is um, where you have, you're delivering us a, an application to a customer. It can be either an internal customer or an external customer. And you're also making sure that there's some sort of subscription associated with it in some manner. Multi-tenancy is different. Multi-tenancy is an architecture principle in which you have multiple tenants working with it or hosted within a, a certain environment. ISV is an is also known as a software development company nowadays. Um, it is a basically the, in, uh, what is it? the independent software vendor. So an independent software vendor is someone who sells software to a, a client. And then finally, startups. Startups are startups. So we know what a startup is. So just to kind of level set on what those definitions are. So again, we're going to be talking mostly about SaaS. You can have a, a single tenant, or you can have multi-tenant. You can be an ISV. Um, where you're selling software, or you can be a startup that's an ISV who has a multi-tenant environment and is planning to have a SaaS business model. OK, so what we're going to do now is talk a bit about what is the well-architected framework. So let's talk about maybe 10, 15% of the hands in the room uh, rose when uh, there was a WAF, when it's we talked about WAF. snacks, though, so I think we can get that to 20%. Yeah, we, so hopefully 100% by the time. OK, 100%. We'll go for 100 so, um, so what is the well-architected framework? It's, it's, we also call it the WAF, which is the Web Application Firewall. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the well-architected framework. So what is the well-architected framework? The well-architected framework focuses on a specific workload, where a workload is basically some, a, a, a solution in which you're uh, defining a given set of uh, solutions a given set of capabilities that is solving it for a given uh, requir set of requirements. What it's not necessarily is a resource that is driven, driving a particular uh, set of re um, capabilities. So what we're going to talk about is how, a, how you apply the five pillars that, that we just talked about to a well-architected or to a workload so that it is well-architected. One of the most important things we'll get to in just a second is that well-architected um, also suggests that among the pillars, you're going to have trade-offs. And this is a really important part to the well-architected framework, because when you talk about trade-offs, what you're really talking about is 
if I have something that's really secure or needs to be really secure, there's probably going to be some sort of cost association with it that you need to, you need to realize. Or on the other hand, if you're trying to cost optimize for that given workload, how is that going to imply or implicate security requirements or reliability requirements, et cetera? So what is the well-architected framework? It, is a, it has four different components. It has a design methodology. It has, a design, it has design principles. And then it has design areas. So you can look at each one of those like as a cupid doll. So you open up the design methodology first to kind of have a sense for what it is. Then you go into what are the design principles, which are effectively the, the, the pillars. And then you have the design areas, which are really focused on that given workload. And then with that, you have a wall architective framework assessment. So what the assessment does is it really helps to determine if you're looking at your given workload, what if you're actually applying these design principles and design areas in the right way. So we'll talk a little bit more about at the end. So I'm going to go even faster because we have a lot of slides. Um, so the, the well architected framework has this set of meth this method methodology here. And what I really want to point at is those pillars in the middle, because what you're effectively doing is you're, again, kind of diving down into the architecture to really understand where, where you need to be focusing. And so a lot of customers will look at one pillar or two pillars, but not all five pillars at once. And this is something that we really suggest you do, is that you really look at all five pillars, even though in the assessment, which we'll show in a second, that you can choose just one or two. So we're going to dive a little deeper now into the SaaS um, set of uh, work areas. And, and then I'll show you at the end um, kind of what all the different design areas are. So the governance um, for SaaS is actually a really important uh, consideration because, as we all know, when you think about a, a given workload, that workload is, eh, it can be whatever. But as soon as you start selling that workload to a set of end customers, governance becomes really, really important both for yourself along with your customers. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So would this be like isolating data, so making sure that like my data is not going to be mixed up with somebody else's data? Oh, that yeah. kind of governance? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that kind of governance. So you have that sort of data governance. You also have cost governance. And you can, you can fit data governance into the security and compliance com uh, area. And so with cost governance, what you're really talking about is tagging resources understanding the cost of a given set of resources, applying that and, ta and tracking those resources for a, a cost set of implications. At the same time, you're also going to be looking at how do you apply a certain policy across all these different resources to understand what that, that cost is for that given workload. The same can be used for security and compliance. Security and compliance are, is basically using a set of guardrails that basically is coming most likely from your central IT teams to determine, is this given workload, is this set of tenants um, in security compliance, or it is secure and are they compliant? And you can do that for both your own internal um, set of requirements, or you can do that for your customers' requirements all as well. So there's a, a sense of a proxy there. So quickly, um, where we are with cost governance, it, so some of the design recommendations that we have for cost are things like making sure that you use the cost management calculator. So the cost management calculator is actually super important because one, it gives you all the different material, all the content you need um, for each one of the services, and then and then allows you to calculate for that given workload. I'll go faster. Policy. So Azure policy is a great way to make sure that you apply a policy in an automated fashion, fa fashion across all your re recommendations, all your resources. And then finally, uh, when it comes to cost, you're also going to be th really thinking about using things like the pricing calculator and governance uh, methodologies. So what I've done, what, what this here is right here is, is basically a copy and paste of a table that you find in the, the documentation. And so I did that mainly just so you had a sense for what it is. And I'll show you in a second what the other design principles look like. The same goes with this given um, table here. This is effectively a, a copy paste of the, 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 the content so you can get a sense for what you actually see. 
And from there, I'm going to give hand it over to Charles and yeah. So thanks, Ben. Yeah. So we've got about five minutes left. We'll just look at networking next. And again, this is these are just two of the design areas, right? Um, where there's there's nine of them. So we're not looking at all nine. We're just kind of giving you an example of two of these that we're trying to look into. So if we're thinking about networking, this is really about, really about deployment strategies. What is the perimeter of this look like for the SaaS application? Um, do we have networking components that are going to talk to each other through uh, cross-network connectivity? Do we have north-south connectivity, east-west? You know, how, do, how is that going to be designed? And then is there anything in the customer environment, right? So if it's a SaaS solution, main parts of the application may be in your tenant and your subscription, but are there components that are going to be deployed into a customer's environment or a customer subscription? And then how does that connect back into your core environment? So all things to think about and consider from a, a broader networking perspective. As we think of that part of the strategy, and again, this is another one of those tables or points from the documentation that we that we had written out there. Another part of that is the tenancy model. So Ben mentioned multi-tenancy is part of the, the SaaS solution. You know, is this going to be a single tenant solution? Is this going to be a multi-tenant solution that can change your networking, right? Because now if it's going to be single tenant, are you going to have different virtual networks? different perimeters, like how, again, does that change and evolve your, your broader networking strategy? And then within that, again, we've got to think about, well, is it going to be a flat network? Are we done doing hub and spoke? Are we going to go with a PaaS first model where we don't really have a network? We're using these, uh, the public endpoints of Azure PaaS resources. You know, how does that design impact the networking component of, uh, of our SaaS application? And then one final diagram, and we'll jump over to those assessments and look at the rest of the docs. Uh, but this is just kind of a sample diagram of what that would look like, right? How are we going to separate our control plane from a SaaS application perspective versus the identities? So where are all the usernames, passwords? How does the, uh, how does the end customer connect in? What does our data plane look like? Where is the compute and the databases? And kind of segmenting that out into their own respective boxes and planning for that communication and connectivity from a networking perspective. Um, so with that, we've only got like two minutes left. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Ben to talk about the assessments. Okay, yeah, so thank you. So one of the things about the WAF, why, why do we have the well-architected framework in the first place? One of the most important reasons is customers need to understand like how, how they should go about architecting their, their workload from the beginning. Because one of the most important aspects is, is that trade-off. Like there's these five different principles that you or pr pillars that you should really be considering, but how do you do so? And that's that's where it becomes really important to have a well-architected framework like this, and that you can apply it to given workload types. So here we have the work we have the SaaS workload type. One of the most when and Charles, you were involved with this is when you go out and talk with customers and get a sense for what went wrong or when, some, when something happened in, the, in production, why? What are those issues? What you get from that is a lot of experience. From that experience, you're, you, we go about codifying that experience in the form of a, of a framework like this so that it becomes possible to use by other customers. So by doing that, what we've created is this assessment to make it easier to not just read the entire workflow or workload because there's about 2,000 pages in, in, the, in the framework. What this assessment does is it allows you to look at your given workload and basically determine what are the issues that could come from it. And so this assessment basically will take you through um, a set of questions. That in this particular um, assessment, I think there's about 45 questions or so, of which they're all divided into the five pillars. And then once you get the, the, the end, to the end of it, you'll get this assessment where it'll give you a score. It'll let you know kind of where you are and what you should focus on. And by, okay, and by doing so, you'll get this, these results and then you can go to the, the various points in the documentation to really determine what you should work on next. And so I think we're about- if I, don't, if I have a SaaS workload today, I can go on and I can assess it against the five pillars of Well Architected right now? Yes. So there's actually two main scenarios um, in which we see this. One is for go live assessments. So when, you, when you're about to go live with this uh, workload, are you checking all the boxes? And the second is once you are live, once you are in deployment, determine like what sort of architectural drift might come from this sort of workload. So 
everyone's playing the scale. How is that scale going to be impacted um, and going to impact uh, this given workload? Well, thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. All right. Bobby, thanks for awesome. having me. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.